St. Vincent Ferrer on the whole life of our Lord Jesus Christ in the parts of the Mass. I find that the Son of God descending from heaven and assuming human nature in the virginal womb of the Most Holy Virgin Mary up to the day on which he ascended to heaven, our Lord did thirty principal deeds, which is comprehended and encompassed in the Mass. And they are the following. The first work of the thirty, in which our Master and Savior Jesus Christ did for us in this world, was his sublime and wonderful incarnation. When descending from heaven, he placed himself in the bosom of the Virgin Mary, by which he put on our vesture, that is, our humanity, for the divinity was hidden under the humanity. And this wonderful work is symbolized and represented in the solemn high mass, when the priest enters the sacristy, signifying the entry of the Son of God into the bosom of the Virgin Mary, where he was, was clothed with our humanity. Here the devout Christian ought to contemplate three things. First, that just as in the sacristy there are relics, jewels, and other ecclesiastical decorations, so in this glorious sacristy, that is, in the virginal womb of Mary, there were relics, namely, the power of God the Father working, wisdom and the person of God the Son incarnating himself, and the grace of the Holy Ghost informing. These were jewels, namely, grace and virtues, for in the Virgin Mary dwells the fullness of grace and virtues, and ornaments with which our high priest is about to celebrate Mass on Good Friday on the altar of the true cross, in the sacred and sanctified body of Jesus Christ, from the purest and most chaste blood of the Virgin Mary formed and incarnated in her womb. Second is that when the priest is vested in the sacristy, no laymen see him, but they believe that he is vested in the hope that he will come forward shortly for Mass. For which it must be noted that when our Lord the High Priest, Jesus Christ, vested himself in the virginal womb of the Virgin Mary, no one from the Jewish people saw him or knew him, in the same way that his incarnation was hidden and kept secret. The believers, however, believed and hoped that he would vest himself, that is, be incarnated and born of the Virgin Mary, just as, as it had been prophesied by many prophets. Third is that the priest in the sacristy puts on seven vestments, namely the cassock, if he is a simple priest, if he's a bishop, a rocher, if he's a monk, a scapular, and then the amice, alb, cincture, maniple, stole, and chasuble. So our great high priest vested himself in the womb of the Virgin Mary, who was called a sacristy, and put on seven vestments, namely the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, by which the most sacred body of Jesus Christ is vested and dressed. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. This is the first work in the symbolism of the Mass. The second work which our Savior Jesus did was when on the night of his birthday, Christmas night, God and man came out from the virginal womb and revealed himself to the whole world. And the night which had been dark was illuminated like the day. And he wished to be born before St. Joseph and Mary, and placed him in the middle of two animals, the donkey and the ox. And a multitude of angels were chanting, Glory to God in the highest, Gloria in excelsis Deo, and the shepherds adored him. Secretly, our Lord remained in the glorious sacristy, that is, in the Virgin Mary, and then, after his birth, Openly and publicly, he declared himself. 
This is symbolized when the priest comes out from the sacristy for Mass. In the High Mass, the deacon represents the Virgin Mary, the subdeacon, St. Joseph, the two acolytes holding the candles represent the ox and the ass. The light which they carry signifies the brightness which showed forth at the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The priests who process in the procession, they represent the multitude of angels singing glory to God in the highest, Gloria in excelsis Deo. The bells which ring signifies the great joy of the shepherds when they were celebrating with the sound of flutes the birth of our Savior and High Priest. When the priest exits the sacristy dressed in gleaming vestments, the priest symbolizes the purity of Jesus Christ, who pure and shining remained without the stain of sin. The third wonderful work which Jesus did was when on the eighth day after his nativity, he willed to be circumcised. For original sin, circumcision, circumcision happened, for which in no way was Jesus Christ obliged, since he was without any stain of sin. But accepting it, he taught us a great example of humility wishing to appear as a sinner and in the likeness of sin. And this the priest symbolizes when making a profound bow, he prays the confidior at the foot of the altar, that he is a sinner, saying, I confess to Almighty God, Confiteo Deo Omnipotenti, Beata Maria Semi Virgini, etc. Although the priest is already sacramentally absolved, he is nevertheless bound to declare himself a sinner, even if he were holier than St. John the Baptist. For demonstrating and signifying that Jesus Christ, who is the beginning and fullness of all sanctity and perfection, wished to appear a sinner, subjecting himself to the law of circumcision, so that he might put an end to it and fulfill it, or signifying the mystical body of the Church and all of mankind. The fourth work, which our Lord did, was when he summoned the three kings from the east, led by a star, to Bethlehem, which led them up to the manger of the ox and ass, in the middle of which they adored and professed Christ to be God and Lord of the universe, offering him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is symbolized when the priest at Mass after the confidior, ascends the altar and kisses it, profoundly bowing his head and saying, Take away from us, O Lord, we beseech thee, all our iniquities, that we may enter with pure minds into the Holy of Holies. That's the prayer, Alfer an nobis. And just as the three kings brought three gifts, so the priest offers by bowing himself, First, the incense of devout prayer. Second, the gold of adoration with great reverence. And three, the bitter myrrh signing himself with the sign of the cross at the introit, in memory of the sorrowful and bitter passion of Jesus Christ. The, th the fifth work which Jesus Christ did in this world was when he wished to be presented in the temple. His glorious mother brought him there and presented him. And there were present Simeon and that holy widow, Anna, praising God. This the priest symbolizes when he comes to the side of the altar, receives the missal, and reads the introit of the Mass on the epistle side. At a high mass, the deacon and subdeacon symbolize the glory of Simeon and the prophetess Anna. The acolytes and the others who should not approach the altar symbolize the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph and the other ancients and parents who were standing in the temple at a distance listening and devoutly paying attention, 
Truly the Virgin Mary was entirely worthy that she should approach the altar, but she chose not to, to give an example to the laity who also, as holy and justified, ought not to ascend to the altar unless because of an urgent necessity. When the holy man Simeon received the glorious Son of God as an infant, he sang four verses in the Nunc Dimittis, recorded in St. Luke chapter 2, verse 29 to 32. These four verses signify the four actions which the priest does, namely, the reading of the introit, second, the Kyrie eleison, which is the same as imploring the mercy, the mercy of God the Father for himself and others, third, the glory to God in the highest, the Gloria in excelsis Deo, and fourth, the praying of the collect of the Mass. These four verses symbolize the Nunc Dimittis, the prayer of St. Simeon, offering the child Jesus in the temple. The sixth work which our Lord Jesus Christ did in this world was when he fled from the promised land to the land of Egypt, yielding the place to the fury and anger of Herod. And here he remained with his glorious mother and St. Joseph for seven years. And this is represented in a solemn high mass when the subdeacon with the one acolyte goes to read the epistle. The priest remaining at the altar with another and a deacon and then take to themselves from the altar and are seated at the sedilia. And sitting they do seven things which represent the seven years when Jesus Christ remained in Egypt. First, the epistle is read. Second, the responsory. Third, the Alleluia, which is a Hebrew word which means we adore and praise God. Fourth, a sequence. Fifth, a blessing is given to the deacon. He performs the last act, standing, signifying that in the seventh year, Jesus Christ returned to his own land in Nazareth. The seventh work which our Lord did in this world, was when having returned from Egypt into the promised land after the death of Herod, led by his mother and St. Joseph into the temple of Jerusalem, and there he stayed. And on the third day his mother and St. Joseph discovered him in the temple, in the middle of the teachers and rabbis listening to them and asking questions. This is the finding of Jesus in the temple. And this represents the priest, when rising from his seat, goes to the altar, and with devout attention listens to the singing of the gospel by the deacon, signifying that in the temple Jesus Christ listened to the Jews, and he, having been questioned, prudently was instructing them in the faith of the Messiah. And so the gospel ended, the priest intones the credo, I believe in one God. The eighth work which our Savior Jesus Christ did in this world was that when he was found by his mother and St. Joseph in the temple, so much was their joy that they were not able to keep from tears, which Jesus Christ, seeing out of humility and love, left the teachers and came with them to Nazareth, where that he might console Mary and St. Joseph of the sadness which they had had at his omission in absence. He served them according to the gospel which says he was subject to them. In this humble service the priest symbolizes at Mass when, having said the credo, he turns himself to the people, saying, Dominus Voviscum. And then he arranges the host and chalice and the other things pertaining to the holy sacrifice at the offertory of the Mass symbolizing the deference of Jesus Christ towards the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, as it is said by St. Paul in St. Matthew chapter 20, The Son of Man is not come to be, to be ministered unto, but to minister. The ninth work, which he did in this world, 
was when, thirty years old, our Lord left Nazareth, where he was serving his mother and St. Joseph, and in many ways. For the other, he, with the other boys, he used to go down to the spring, which was a long way from Nazareth. And he also helped St. Joseph in his carpentry work. And after he had completed 30 years, he left them and went to the Jordan River and received baptism, which baptism indeed was not necessary for him, but he accepted it so that through contact with his sacred body, there might be communicated to the water throughout the whole world the regenerative power for saving those believing and obeying him by baptism. And this the priest symbolizes when he washes his fingers, not because of necessity, since he is pure in conscience through sacramental confession, and he has already washed his hands, but to commemorate the testimony of humility which Jesus Christ gave, wishing to be baptized. The tenth work which our Savior did in this world was according to St. Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that after the baptism he went into the desert and fasted forty days and forty nights, neither eating nor drinking, but the whole time staying in prayer, not praying for himself, but for us. And this is symbolized when the priest at the middle of the altar bows profoundly and says the prayer in spiritu humilitatis, in the spirit of humility, praying that in the holy sacrifice we might become a sacrifice, ostia, which is pleasing to the Lord our God. This prayer commemorates the prostrations and humiliations which the Savior was doing in the desert, praying and beseeching. The priest, however, turns himself around to the people, saying, Orate fratres, pray, brethren, for me that my sacrifice in yours may be acceptable before God. And those attending should say, the, the altar boys or the deacon, the Holy Ghost come over you. Sushipia Dominus Sacrificium Nemanibus Tuis. The note that the prayer of Jesus Christ in the desert was secret. So in this step, the priest prays secretly so that not even the deacon nor the subdeacon can hear. The eleventh work which Jesus the Savior did was that after he had fasted, he began to preach, crying out, Do penance, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And the priest, symbolizing this by say, saying in a loud voice, Lift up your hearts, sursum corda, at the preface of the Mass, by teaching us that Jesus Christ taught both by mouth and by example. And so as he chants the preface, he holds his hands up and not down. The twelfth work which Jesus Christ did in this world was that not only was he teaching by word and deed, but he confirmed his sacred teachings with miracles. For only God can work, work such things, namely, raise the dead, give sight to the blind, heal the paralytics, etc. And this the priest commemorates when three times at Mass, at the end of the preface, he says, Santus, Santus, Santus denoting that Jesus Christ worked miracles not through his human power, but in virtue of the three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the one and all-powerful God. Finally, he says, Osana in excelsis, that is, saving, to demonstrate that Christ worked miracles so that he might save us. The thirteenth work which he did in this world was when, after he had preached and worked many miracles, at thirty-three years of age he came to Jerusalem so that he might dine at the Last Supper with his disciples. And secret, secretly many things were necessary for the redemption of mankind, especially two, namely the institution of the Most Blessed Sacrament of the Altar, the Holy Eucharist, and the Great Discourse, which is 
prolonged in the chapters 13 to 17 in St. John's Gospel. And this is symbolized when the priest quietly reads the canon of the Mass, only the deacon hearing, just as only the apostles heard the last discourse of Christ at the Last Supper. The fourteenth work was when these two things done, our Lord entered, in, entered into the Garden of Gethsemane, and there offered three prayers, demonstrating that in so far as man he prayed to God the Father for three conditions of people, namely, for the Holy Fathers who were in purgatory, he prayed for those present in the world at that time, and for those in the future. After the third prayer, he sweat blood, warning that those who were to come with special fervor ought to pray because of the great dangers and trials which shortly will come upon them and which they will not be able to overcome unless by fervent prayers and in the strength of patience. The priest symbolizes these three prayers in the Mass by making three signs of the cross over the chalice, saying, Bless, approve, and ratify. And finally, two other crosses, of which one is over the chalice. And he says, and of the blood, that we might know that in, the, in his passion he prayed for himself in so far as he was a man, and for us sinners. This is the quam oblationem of the Mass. The fifteenth work was when, after the aforesaid prayer, a great multitude of people came forward with a great clamor with swords and clubs to seize Jesus. And he calmly and most kindly was willing to be arrested and bound and led before Pontius Pilate, who sentenced him to death on the cross from which sentence he wished not to appeal, but gently accepted and, and carried his blessed cross. And this is represented in the Mass when the priest takes the host for consecrating it, which he holds in his hands, saying, and lifting up his eyes to heaven. And then there is a great sounding of the bells at the consecration, signifying the tumult and sounds of the Jews when they arrested Jesus. Then the priest makes the sign of the cross over the host, saying, Bless and break, benedicit et fregit, signifying the sentence of death passed by Pontius Pilate. This ringing of bells is at the Ankijitur. The sixteenth work was when, sentenced to death, Jesus Christ was led to death on Calvary, and there he was crucified between two thieves, one on his right, who was called St. Dismas, and the other on the left, named Justus. And this is signified in the Mass when the priest, after consecrating, consecrating the, the host, elevates the consecrated host, in which is Christ, God and man. And he holds it with both hands. The right hand signifies the good thief, the left the bad thief. After this, he elevates the precious blood in the chalice, signifying that Jesus Christ on the cross offered and sacrificed his precious blood to God the Father for the redemption of mankind. For which reason the priest elevating the most precious blood ought to say to himself, we offer to Thee, Lord, the inestimable price of our redemption. The seventeenth work which Jesus Christ did was that when He was crucified, He did not cease to pray. And first He said in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, My God, my God, why hast Thou abandoned me? To which words St. Jerome adds, Look upon me. And he continued prayer up to the verse, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so there were 150 syllables in all the words of Christ on the cross to correspond with the 150 psalms. 
And while he was on the cross, the wicked Jews did not cease laying on him injuries and curses, and others saying, Va, you who destroyed the temple of God, and others saying, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Others finally shouted, He saved others, himself he cannot save. And the Lord calmly did not reply, but continued in prayer with great patience. And this the priest symbolizes when he holds his arms right after the consecration, extended in the form of a cross, and he prays, saying, Unde et memores. Mindful therefore, Lord, we thy ministers, etc. The eighteenth work which Jesus Christ did in this world was when, although already wounded with four wounds, namely in his hands and feet, nevertheless he wished after his death to be pierced with a lance in his sacred side, in his most sacred heart, from where flowed out blood and water, which miraculously happened, contrary to nature, for all his blood had already been poured out, first in the scourging, then in the crowning of thorns, and in the nailing of his hands and feet. And these five principal wounds are signified when the priest makes the sign of the cross five times over the consecrated host and precious blood. And this is the in the prayer unde et memores. The nineteenth work was when Christ crucified, crying out, said the seven last words, which is commemorated when the priest recites the nobis quoque peccatoribus and the Our Father, the Pater Noster, in which seven petitions are contained. And indeed, he does not say it secretly, but chanting, just as, just as Christ on the cross spoke out with a loud voice. The twentieth work was that Christ wanted his most sacred humanity to be divided into three parts, namely the body on the cross, the blood shed in the tortures, and the soul which descended into the limbo of the fathers. And this is represented in the Mass when the priest divides and breaks the host into three parts. It must be noted, however, that he holds them together because even though the most holy humanity of Christ had been divided, never was the divinity separated from it. Moreover, it was united to each part, as St. Paul says. What he assumed once, he never divided. It is similar to when a fragment of crystal is exposed to the sunlight, and then it is smashed into many more fragments. The sun lights up each part of the same crystal that it lights up when it, when it lit up the whole crystal. So each part of the humanity of Christ personally and substantially was filled with the divinity, just as the fragments of the crystal are filled with the sunlight. The 21st work which Christ does in this world was that after his holy passion, he did not immediately ascend into heaven, but through his most profound humanity wished first to descend secretly to the limbo of the fathers, that he might give glory to these fathers, awaiting him with such great expectation. At that moment they saw him, they were filled with great exultation, enjoying the essential glory of the beatific vision, now and forever free from any pain. And this the priest prefigures when he puts a particle of the host into the chalice to denote how the soul of Christ descending into the limbo of the fathers so rejoiced the holy fathers and confirmed them that they hardly knew what happened to them in experiencing such a fullness of happiness. And from that sweetness and love they praised God saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he hath visited and wrought the redemption of his people. Benedictus Dominus Deus Israel, quia visitavit et fece redemption in plebis sue, Israel. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. 
The 22nd work which Christ performed was when he converted the many kinds of people wishing to show the fruit of his passion. And first he, confer he converted the good thief, a man of bad life and wicked deeds. Second, he converted the centurion, a leader of soldiers, who said, indeed, this man was the Son of God. And third, the ordinary people, according to which St. Luke said, and all the multitude of them saw these things that were done, namely the miracles which happened with the eclipse of the sun for three hours, the earthquake, and the ripping of the veil of the temple from top to bottom, and they returned, striking their breasts. St. Luke chapter 23, verse 48. These various people are symbolized in the Mass when the priest three times says, Agnus Dei, qui tolis beccata mundi, miss, at the three Agnus Dei prayers. First, he prays for every sinner, signifying that the Lord our God wishes to spare him, the sinner, just as he spared the thief. Second, signifying that just as Jesus Christ illuminated the centurion, so the governors of the people, whether spiritual or temporal, our Lord desires to illuminate them and pardon them. And just as the souls moved by the passion of Christ come to salvation, so the priest, saying the third Agnus Dei, asks on behalf of the whole Christian people that the Lord deign to keep them in peace and in health, to pardon the sins of each, and make them worthy participants of his holy grace. The twenty-third work which Jesus Christ did in this world was when, after his painful death, he willed and ordered his body to be taken down from the cross by his friends, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, and Gamaliel, having received permission from Pontius Pilate, and they laid him to rest behind a large stone, which today can still be seen in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And then the Virgin Mary and St. Mary Magdalene and the other devout people let out great cries of grief. And this is represented in the Mass when the priest says three times, Domine non sum dignus. For a short period of time during which he holds the body of Christ in his hands. He ought to think of the sorrow of the Virgin Mary and of the others who were mourning, and so should shed many, shed many tears and to conceive a special sorrow for his own sins. The twenty-fourth work was what Christ wished to be, anointed with balsam and myrrh, to be wrapped in a clean burial cloth and placed in a tomb, newly carved in the stone without any corruption or fracture. And this is represented in the Mass when the priest consumes the body of Christ, because the heart of the priest ought to be a new tomb without corruption. And just as the tomb of Christ was of solid rock, so should the priest be strong in faith and a good life. And just as the body of Christ was wrapped in a clean shroud, so the conscience of the priest ought to be cleaned and shine forth with chastity. And just as the body of Christ was anointed with balsam and spices, so the heart of the priest ought to be saturated with every kind of virtue, not just the priest, but also every Christian hearing Mass. With these thoughts, it is fitting to nourish their devotion. The twenty-fifth work which Christ did was when he rose on the third day from death to life, and his tomb was opened at the glorious resurrection. And this the priest signifies when he comes from the middle to the side of the altar at the epistle side, signifying that Christ from the mortal world passed into immortal life and showing the empty chalice as it signifies the opened tomb, and Christ, through his infinite power, to have risen, and the deacon folds the corporal at the high mass in remembrance that the holy shroud by which the sacred body of Jesus was wrapped had been found in the tomb. 
The 26th work was that after his resurrection, Christ appeared to the glorious Virgin Mary, his mother, although of this in the gospel there is no mention. The holy doctors nevertheless expressly affirm it, and especially St. Ambrose in his book on virgins. And indeed it was exquisitely fitting that Christ before any others visited and comforted his mother, who more than the others has suffered from his death. And this the priest prefigures by saying with his face to the people, Dominus Vobiscum, and then he reads the post-communion, which is a prayer of great consolation, representing the consoling words which Christ said to his, his mother, and the great praise which the Holy Fathers gave to her, saying, O Queen of Heaven, rejoice! The twenty-seventh work which Christ did in this world was when he appeared to the apostles together in the upper room on Easter Sunday and said, Peace be to you. And this is represented in the Mass <clears throat> when the priest, turning around to the people, saying again, Dominus Vobiscum, which is the same as namely, Peace be to you all. The twenty-eighth work was when he gathered the apostles and said, Go ye into the whole world and preach to every creature. Matthew, St. Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. <clears throat> and this is symbolized at Mass when the priest says, Ite misa est. Go, the Mass is ended. Every believer returning to his work because the holy sacrifice is completed. The 29th work was when he fulfilled the promise made to St. Peter and the Holy Apostles, namely establishing St. Peter in possession of the papacy, saying, Feed my lambs. Then indeed, according to all the teachers, truly our Lord constituted St. Peter as the head of the universal church. And to the other apostles he said, Receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them, etc., giving power of forgiving the sins, which is divine power. And this is represented at the end of Mass, which the priest, humbling himself profoundly, bows his head as much as he can before the altar and says, May it be pleasing to thee, O Blessed Trinity, the Placea Tibi Santa Trinitas, petitioning the Holy Trinity that the, that the Holy Sacrifice be acceptable to God, and be beneficial for all the souls of the people. And this bow which he makes kissing the altar denotes the infinite mercy of our God, who did not consider it unworthy to be humble and to humble himself by his divine power, passing on to sinful men the power of forgiving sins. And finally, making the sign of the cross over the people, signifying that their sins are forgiven, though through the sacred passion of Christ and the sacrament of confession. And the last and the thirtieth work of Christ in this world was when in the presence of his mother and the holy apostles and about fifty people, according to St. Paul, standing on Mount, Ol Mount Olivet, our Lord wished to ascend to heaven, and raising his hands, blessed all these that were lamenting his absence, and he returned to where he had come from. And this is signified in the Mass, when the priest, having given the blessing and said the last gospel, returns to the sacristy in the recessional from where he had come. And so the whole life of our, of our Redeemer in the sacred holy sacrifice of the Mass is covered, to which glory may he lead us, he who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.